given that the main goal of this workshop is about like connecting statistics, computer science, and gravitational wave analysis. So I choose this topic about tracking a continuous gravitational wave signal with the hidden Markov model. So um, basically, I want to tell you about the main challenges we are facing when analyzing long duration gravitational waves and how we use some classic signal processing techniques to overcome these difficulties. Um, okay, so the talk will be mainly divided into two parts. For the first half, I'll give an overview of continuous gravitational wave sources and long transient gravitational waves and why are we interested in them and the major challenges we are facing when searching for these waves. And then for the second part, I mainly focus on signal processing and then tell you about this very useful hidden Markov model tracking technique and how that works and how we apply that to gravitational wave analysis. So we will start from the first part. Um, um, since I, I'm not too sure about the background of the audience, I just put together some brief overview here. Um, I believe that you already learned the latest the discovery and a bit about gravitational wave detectors. So very quickly, um, these, wave, these gravitational waves ripples in space time were predicted by Einstein more than a hundred years ago. And in recent years, they have been directly observed on Earth by these super sensitive detectors. And uh, the strain induced by these gravitational waves when they pass Earth in the detector is denoted by this H naught here that's defined as the differential displacement in the detector arm, delta L divided by the total length of the arm. So as you can see, um, these detectors are extremely sensitive to tiny displacements, so we can observe such weak waves and study their astrophysical sources. So uh, on September 14th, 2015, we observed the very first gravitational wave event from two emergent black holes. Uh, this bright region stands for a signal with increasing frequency and lasts for a very short amount of time, a fraction of a second. And these wiggles stand for the string data observed by the two LIGO detectors. Um, another highlighted event I want to mention here is the very first uh, binary neutron star merger event, GW170017. So in this event, we do not only observe gravitational waves like the chirp signal indicated by these bright curves with increasing frequency. We also observe electromagnetic counterparts across the spectrum, like from gamma ray, x-ray, um, UV, optical, infrared, and radio. So they come from the consistent sky position. And as this panel shows, the optical image of the host galaxy and with this little dot indicating the event which appeared after the merger and it was not there before. So basically this event really opened the window of multi-messenger astronomy and bring us a lot of interesting and invaluable information. So uh, with the sensitivity improvement of these detectors, we now have observed in total uh, 90 um, compact binary merger events with these black holes, neutron stars with different mass and plotted in this chart. So, so many detections, but the, these are not the main goal of the talk today. Actually, I want to um, talk about other types of gravitational wave sources. So all these detections fall into the first category. We only observe the chip signal from compact binary uh, mergers. Um, but at least there are three other types of gravitational waves we are searching for. So uh, similarly for very short transient signal, we also look for uh, like uh, signals from supernova explosion. And we also search for long duration gravitational waves like uh, persistent stochastic background from unresolved astrophysical sources. And these continuous quasi-monochromatic uh, gravitational radiation from spinning neutron stars. So this is the main topic uh, for the rest of the talk. Okay, so uh, let's first take a look at the mechanism of generating these continuous waves. And there are a few of them. So first, the 
non-axisymmetric deformation due to the elastic stress or magnetic field of the neutron star can produce such little bump on surface of the neutron star. And this is on the level of a fraction of millimeter, you know, a tiny, tiny mountain. Um, but because neutron star is, is super dense, so as the star rotates, it will continuously generate um, very weak emission, but it's, it's always there as the neutron star rotates. The gravitational wave frequency would be twice the spin frequency of the star in this case, and the strain uh, can be estimated by this equation here. Basically, that's the constant. Uh, I is the principal moment of inertia. This is the wave frequency, and D is distance from Earth to the source. This ellipticity here uh, from these three principal moments of inertia basically stands for how deformed the neutron star is. If we take these fiducial values, you can see the estimated strain is very small and orders of magnitude weaker than a typical compact binary coalescence signal. So that's why it's extremely difficult to uh, search for these weak emissions. But on the other hand, because they are persistent, they are always there. So we can integrate over a long time, like even across a few runs to increase the signal to noise ratio. So it's a long duration search. Um, if the neutron star is in some kind of free precession, there will be additional features like the emission frequency would be roughly once and twice the spring frequency of the star. Um, there are also other mechanisms of generating continuous waves like R modes. Those are the long lasting oscillation modes in the fluid interior of neutron star, as the movie shows here. Um, but basically, if you search for Rossby waves, which is the same mechanism as R mode, it's not unique to neutron star, it's even very common on Earth. So basically, um, the waves generated under this mechanism is around four thirds of the spin frequency of the neutron star. And again, we can estimate the string amplitude from such uh, mechanism. And this alpha here stands for R mode amplitude. But basically, you can see it's still um, on the order of 10 to the minus 26. It's tiny um, gravitational radiation. So we still need to consider integrating the data over a long time. So these are the emission from isolated neutron star. Um, there are also interesting scenario like this one in accreting system. So you can see this neutron star is feeding on a companion star like a white dwarf. And um, so the matter accretion will cause the deformation on the surface of the star and that naturally power gravitational wave emission. Uh, very interestingly, the torque balance theory says um, basically the accretion will spin up the star because the matter keep hitting the surface of the star. And the gravitational wave emission on the other hand will slow it down because it loses energy. So at some point, some balance is reached and neutron star is spinning at a stabilized frequency. So the wave is emitted roughly twice the spin frequency of the star. But when searching for such signals, one thing we need to consider is the signal frequency or the spin frequency of the star is working randomly. So there might be some random fluctuation because of the fluctuation in the accretion flow. So we will come back to that when talking about analysis. Um, if we can detect these tiny waves, they will help us to study the barely non-interior of the neutron star, uh, the properties like mass and ellipticity, nuclear equation of state. We might discover exotic state of matter. And if we also have electromagnetic observation like from non-pulsars, um, we can even do multi-message study, for example, studying the mass and magnetic field structure uh, by comparing the relative phase between the two types of signals. So we can also test the general relativity using the long lasting signal, uh, et cetera. So that's really interesting. Um, so in addition to these conventional continuous waves from neutron stars, we also look for more exotic um, signals like from boson clouds around black holes. So that's a completely different mechanism, but a very brief summary here. So these new not yet detected ultralight boson particles have been predicted in many 
beyond the standard theory, uh, beyond the standard model series. So they are proposed to solve problems in particle physics, high energy physics. So include like uh, QCD axion, spring axion, etc. They can also be dark matter candidates. So the main idea is if there exists an ultralight boson field around a rotating black hole, when certain condition is satisfied, the field can extract the rotational energy from the black hole. This is called super radiance. So this phenomenon becomes significant when the Compton wavelength of the particle is comparable to the black hole size. It's like naturally forming a cavity around the black hole. So the wave, the field gets trapped and um, bounced back and forth, grows exponentially, and finally forming a cloud like the figure shows here. And then there will be huge number of particles occupying a single energy level. And then the emission is like a coherent, uh, continuous and quasi monochromatic. Um, that's very similar to the conventional waves from neutron stars, and the wave frequency would be directly connected to the energy level of these particles. So we can use very similar method to uh, look for these waves, although generated by a completely different mechanism, but they are also long lasting continuous waves. Um, and by Studying them, we can actually probe a very interesting parameter space for these ultralight particles, which is basically impossible to test on Earth. And that might even lead to a new detection of particles using astrophysical approach. So these are all interesting aspects. Um, before talking about analysis, there's another group of waves I want to mention here. Uh, that's basically long transient gravitational waves. So any signal with time scale in between these transient signals and persistent waves uh, can fall into this category. Like it can last for second, minute, hours, days, weeks, et cetera. So there are many possible sources. Um, and in particular, one very interesting type of source is the post-merger remnant from binary neutron star mergers like GW170 or A17. So does it form a black hole or a neutron star? So what happened? And we, we want to study that. We want to search for the emission from the remnant object. So that's a very interesting topic and we will get to that as well later. Uh, and of course, there are other interesting sources like newly born neutron star in supernova, glitching pulsars, accreting objects, et cetera. So to give you a more visualized picture of uh, the post-merger signal from binary neutron star mergers, this movie shows one possible scenario after the two neutron star collide. Uh, we can stop here and take a look. So there's a remnant object as it uh, slows down and keep emitting these weak emission after the merger. Um, eventually it will lose energy by emitting these waves and finally getting to a black hole. But in this simulation, um, basically that's assuming a particular nuclear equation of state, um, but actually that's unknown. So for example, for GW170 or A17, we don't really know what's left behind. And that's a very interesting question. So the key idea is if we can directly observe those weak emissions after the merger, uh, we will learn the, the whole procedure and the, the whole story. Um, so that's a very interesting topic as well. So we also search for these long duration, long transient gravitational waves. So talking about the search, uh, we have mainly three categories of the search. Um, one is called targeted search, mainly for objects with non-sky position and avail available ephemeris, usually for pulsars. Um, that's relatively cheap because we only search for a narrow frequency band following the EM guidance. The second is more expensive. It's called direct search for objects with non sky position but unknown frequency, usually neutron star in supernova remnants or accreting systems, or boson clouds around non black holes if they do exist. So we basically search for a wide frequency band and looking for any particle emission. And in the end, we have the most expensive all sky search for any possible long duration signal out there for, for any sky position. So there are many difficulties associated with these different searches for various sources. 
basically because we are looking for weak emission uh, last for a long duration, we have to integrate the data over a long time, like a year or even two years, then that's computationally very expensive. Um, second thing is we have a large parameter space especially for direct search and all sky search we do not know the estimated signal frequency so we have to cover the whole frequency band like from tens hertz to thousands hertz for ground-based detectors and for uh, sources which potentially involves quickly like uh, long transient waves we also need to cover a very large parameter space for frequency evolution terms like the f dot f, f double dot etc in addition to that, we have uncertainties like unknown spin wandering. So this effect actually has been seen in the EM observation, you know, from those pulsar signals, we see timing noise uh, from these, these uh, pulsar emissions. So there are physical reasons behind this, like uh, uh, in a single neutron star that there might be fluctuation of the magnetospheric or superfluid torques, or in the accretion system, like we show earlier in the movie, uh, there's fluctuation in the accretion flow. So this phenomenon actually prevents us from integrating the data coherently over a long time because that will cause power leakage. In addition to that, we also have uncertainty from signal models. For example, uh, the prediction in the theory might have some uncertainties themselves. Some minor features might not be taken to consideration in some simplified model we use. So all these things would impact the continuous and long duration gravitational wave searches. So keeping this in mind, uh, let's move on and talk about signal processing. Um, I guess I'll start with Bayes and Siren. I guess I believe you have already learned about this and heard some topics in the previous sessions. Uh, there are relevant topics even in the CBC analysis. Um, a very brief summary here. So basically, we have uh, a sequence of observational data denoted by this X, and it could be collected over time. Um, and we have a set of unknown parameters, which um, tells us about the parameters of, or the properties of the astrophysical source. And that form a vector parameter theta here. So it depends on what source we study, for example, like a neutron star for continuous wave analysis, that could stand for the signal frequency uh, and the evolution terms of the signal frequency, the time derivatives, et cetera, or that could include the sky position of the source or the orientation of the neutron star, et cetera, et cetera. So basically when we have a set of observational data, we are interested in these sets of parameters uh, which can tell us about the astrophysical source. So basically we are interested in the posterior probability on the left-hand side. And according to Bayesian theorem, we know we can calculate that using the right-hand side of the equation. Um, this, this P theta is the prior probability we know about uh, these parameters in advance. And this uh, probability of observing the data given a set of theta is the likelihood we can easily calculate. And finally, in the denominator, that is the evidence, basically a normalization factor. And in most cases, we don't need to worry about it too much. So essentially, uh, we want to find a set of parameter theta, which can maximize this posterior probability. So that is the so-called maximum a posterior uh, parameters. And that gives us the best estimate of the properties of the astrophysical source. So we implement method to estimate these maximum a posterior parameters if there is um, an astrophysical signal. But on the other hand, dep uh, depending on whether we have or have, we don't have a, an astrophysical signal, we also need some statistics to evaluate the sig signif significance. For example, we can set a threshold on the posterior probability. When the probability is above some threshold, we believe there is an astrophysical signal in our data. But if not, that could just be due to noise. 
Okay, so these are the basic concepts, but um, I also have a few more concepts here. So if you look at the diagram that's taken from Wikipedia, it's showing a system um, for the dynamic stock and flow. So basically we don't need to wor wor uh, care about the details here. You are seeing a system involves over time and appearing as different configurations. So uh, a few concepts here for the system we consider, it means it will involve, and we know something about the dynamics of the system and we can measure it at intervals over time. Regarding the states, that mean the possible configuration of a system at a given time. And we track the states of a system over time as the system involves. So in the problem we want to solve here for the continuous wave search or long duration wave search, um, the problem can be interpreted this way. Like this spinning neutron star system, we can regard that as a system we are interested in here. It involves over time, it has its dynamics, and the state could mean the gravitational wave frequency uh, at a given time. It's for a very short time, it could just be monochromatic. And uh, that's, the, that's the system state. And then we can track the gravitational wave frequency over a long time as the neutron star involves. So now you can see for the long durational uh, gravitational wave search, we do not only care about the state for the system for a given time, like a transient signal. Uh, we are also interested in the system dynamics and how it involves over time. Uh, there are many uncertainties associated with this problem. In most cases, we do not know the exact state of the system, like the spin frequency of the star. Um, and the uncertainties might come from dynamic evolution or the measurement at each time interval. In particular, for example, for continuous wave search, the uncertainty of dynamic evolution could mean uh, we have unknown spin wandering, unknown fluctuation in the uh, spin frequency of the star or the spin of the star is involving at some time varying rate. Um, there's fluctuation in the F dot, F double dot, et cetera. Also, because we are looking for a very weak signal in noisy data, the measurement itself will have larger uncertainty. So these things need to be taken into consideration. And when we calculate the posterior probability, we need to capture these uncertainties in the tracking. So now it's the time for me to introduce the hidden Markov model. Um, it's a very useful signal processing technique. And um, in most cases, it's very useful to model dynamic systems in which the states are not directly observable. So I'll give a simple example here. So assuming we have a set of state from one to five, these are the states we are really interested in, but they cannot be directly measured. So we call them hidden states. For example, that could mean the discretized frequency beams where the gravitational wave signal might be in for a given time uh, for the continuous wave that's monochromatic for a given time. And then they have some, uh, they will appear as those um, observable states, like different shapes. That could mean the noisy data we see in the detector data. And they are connected to each other via these black curves, which we call emission probability. So the darkness stands for the likelihood. Basically, if we see a square, that means it's more likely it, it's actually in hidden state one. Uh, it has a smaller probability to be in two, and it's not possible to be in three, four, five. So similar for the others. And then this hidden Markov model also model the dynamics of the system. As time goes, the system will evolve and these states will change. So that's um, in the hidden Markov model, that's basically modeling the dynamics with a Markov chain. So there's no memory. That means um, basically for the next time step, the state would only depend on the state at the current step. 
and that is governed by the so-called transition probability. To give you an example, if we are at state two at the moment, for the next time step, there's a higher probability to involve into five and lower probability to go to one and no other possibilities. And this model, the transition for each um, step moving forward and then connecting these states together and forming a Markov chain. So over time, you know, we will observe a sequence of these shapes. Now we want to ask a question, what is actually the hidden state chain? So the probability of a hidden path given an observational sequence can be calculated by multiplying all these probabilities together. Basically the emission probability, uh, these black curves calculated for every discrete time step and the, the transition probability from one step to next, connecting these things together. And finally, this term is the prior. So the problem just becomes um, how to find the maximum a posterior hidden path given an observational sequence. So this problem, so this model actually matches the problem we want to solve for continuous wave search very perfectly. Um, uh, and I'll show like a list of application here. You can see this um, hidden Markov model method have been used in various areas, uh, completely different areas. So it's very useful for these problems with the dynamic system, with uncertainty, and with the st states we cannot observe. So, um, okay, so once we model the problem, the next question is how we solve the problem and find the best hidden path. So that's not an easy problem. For example, in our continuous wave search, we usually uh, have hundreds of millions um, frequency bins. That means hundreds of millions hidden states. And we track over a year or even longer. Um, that's, so basically it's not possible to list all the possible paths and then compare their likelihood and see which one is the best. Um, that's computa computationally impossible. Um, so we need some smart algorithm to solve the problem. And that is the, the very famous Viterbi algorithm invented by Andrew Viterbi in 1967. Um, that's a dynamic programming algorithm to very efficiently find the maximum a posterior pass given an observation sequence. This algorithm is based on the Bellman's principle of optimality, which is a key idea of dynamic programming to recursively solve a very complex optimization problem by stages. So I give you a very simple example um, and show you what that actually means. So what this principle of optimality basically says, if we have an uh, optimal, a total optimal pass, from the beginning time step one to the end, the time step K, then any subpass within it from any step I to J must be also be optimal. Um, it's like if you search for Google, what's the best pass from LA to San Francisco, and that's the way you should go. And then the next thing is if you want to ask what's the best pass from A to B, and that must be overlapped with the total optimal pass. It's very easy to prove. So if from I to J, there's a better pass, then the total optimal pass must be replaced by this one. So that's a really simple idea, but it's very important because that can make sure uh, we can just uh, confidently throw away those useless paths while we do the um, dynamic programming um, in, the, in the recursion. So we won't miss the total optimal pass. And that's the key which makes the algorithm extremely fast. So um, the Viterbi algorithm can be summarized as follows. So for every step moving forward in the recursion, we just keep n maximum a posterior pass leading to n different hidden states at the current step um, and just throw away all the rest of the pass. And in the end, when we reach the final step, we can quickly do the backtracking and get the best one. So I know it's, it's difficult to understand just looking at these words. So I, I walk you through this, this procedure step by step. But um, before that, let's take a look at uh, a simple example. 
Um, that's basically summarizing the problem we are facing for continuous wave search. So the vertical axis are the discretized frequency beams in which the signal might be in for a given time step. At horizontally, that's the time step. It could be a year, two years, a month, two months, et cetera. So the color stand for the likelihood or the signal to noise ratio or some statistics we can quantify um, this emission probability for every time step. So the brighter, the better here. And then we also know something about the dynamics of the system, like a signal from neutron star, the frequency won't be jumping from here to here, like within a very short time step. So we can set up some basic rules. For example, if the signal is here, it can involve at most one frequency beams for the next time step. So it can go anywhere in between these three beams, but cannot jump further. So that's some basic rules, but with the uncertainty captured. Now we want to ask the question from left to right, what is the best pass with the total maximum power, but meantime also satisfy these rules? So we model the problem with the heat Markov model and solve it with the Viterbi algorithm. We will find uh, an optimal pass like this one. And the hidden signal is actually like that and they match each other pretty well. So now we will take a look how we actually work like for each step moving forward. Um, for simplicity, I only take four frequency beams here. And now from first step to the second one, we first identify all the possible paths. As I mentioned, we set up some rules and the, the signal can move at most one beam for each step. So these are all the possible paths, like from two, it can only go one, two, three. Now, uh, based on the emission probability, like the color or the signal to noise ratio we estimate from the previous page, we can always find the best four paths leading to the four state at step two. So if we are at step two at the moment, we just want to know what, what's the best path from step one to step two to these four states. Okay, then we threw away the rest of that. From step two to step three, we only identify the possible paths for this single step and take the emission probability for this step and connect it to the previous best one and find again these updated four best paths indicated by red and throughout the rest and so on and so forth. So every time step moving forward, we update the maximum a posterior pass to only keep four best paths leading to these four different states at the country step until the last step. So eventually it will quickly reduce the computing uh, cost, uh, reduce the number of comparison from this kind of power to this kind of uh, product. So that's why this algorithm is extremely efficient to solve a lot of the computing problems in, in our search. So uh, this movie gives the whole picture of how this works. Uh, so moving forward in the last step, backtracking and immediately get the best pass and the hidden signal pass is in light blue. And can, we can see that again. So there's uncertainties. We want to get exactly the same signal pass, but we basically get the frequencies almost right. Okay, so in the end, um, I'll give a few examples of how we apply this method in some more realistic continuous wave and long transient wave searches. Um, these examples are based on simulations. So because for, for illustration purposes, that, that's helpful. So first of all, we can simulate a neutron star in accreting binary systems, which is spinning at a roughly stabilized frequency. But as mentioned earlier, we have the problem of spin wandering or unknown fluctuation because of the fluctuation in the accretion torque. So we can simulate a fluctuating signal as shown in the left of the blue curve. The vertical axis is the frequency and horizontal axis is the time step over about a year. And the green path is the optimal path we can recover. So they basically match each other very well and the fluctuation is on the level of 10 to the minus six Hertz. 
Um, and the main discrepancy here is because we use discretized frequency beams in the tracking and the signal basically involves continuously. Uh, a second example is we can simulate uh, an isolated neutron star, which is spinning down as it loses energy through gravitational wave emission. On top of that, there are also uncertainties like timing noise and fluctuation. So it's not steadily spin down with a fixed rate. As we show in the left panel, this blue curve is the injection and the red curve is the recovery. So in this hidden Markov model, we model the dyna system dynamics with a transition probability such that the signal has a higher probability to move into a lower frequency beam for the next time step, although there's still possibility uh, for it to stay in the current frequency or even go a bit higher for a short amount of time. Because we, we have some basic idea of the system, we know the spin down is a dominant effect, um, although there might be fluctuations for a short amount of time. So a third example is for um, continuous wave signal from ultralight boson clouds around black holes. These signals are slightly different. From the theory um, prediction, we know that the signal will have uh, a slowly increasing frequency. But on top of that, we also have uncertainties which might come from the particle self-interruption in the cloud or some unpredicted features in the theory. So we can simulate a spin-up signal with fluctuations as indicated by the orange curve. The random fluctuation injected is uh, on the top panel. But again, we can recover this path very accurately. Um, this is on the level of, again, 10 to the minus 6 hertz, and this is really zoomed in. So it's, it's almost perfectly recovered the signal. Um, so in this model, instead, we set the transition probability such that the signal has a higher probability to go to a higher frequency beam um, for the next time step, because we know the spin up is a dominant effect in such model. So from these three different examples, you can see when we search for different types of sources, according to our knowledge of the system dynamics, we can easily adjust the transition probability to uh, like capture these different features, although we still allow for these uncertainties. Um, okay, so in the end, um, I'll give another example about the long transient wave search. So, so that will be a much shorter time scale. And especially for the post-merger remnant from binary neutron star merger, as I mentioned earlier, that's a very interesting study. And we also use this method to look for these signals. Um, so as I mentioned, we don't really know what happened after GW170017. There are many scenarios. And one category of the scenario uh, is that a millisecond magnetar will form after the merger. And it will spin down very quickly as it loses energy. So there are still many, many possibilities for the frequency evolution. We just to show a few examples on the left. So this is plotting the signal if frequency evolution as a function of time. And based on uh, different parameters like breaking index and spin down time scale in the model, et cetera. But this is just a few examples um, there basically all possibilities in this whole parameter space. It's very difficult to do a model-based search because you have to cover such wide frequency bands and all kinds of uh, spin down parameters. And also we don't even know if the signal would strictly follow such like a power law, um, um, like power law model to, to decrease or not. It's, it's more likely like the signal will be fluctuating um, and jumping back and forth, and then overall, it's 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 decreasing in frequency. So it's it's very hard to do model based search, but instead we can do a very powerful and efficient uh, search using the hidden Markov model tracking. And we don't really rely on the model; we are just looking for some most likely paths in the data with a decreasing frequency. So I'll show you one uh, simulation example here. 
On the left panels, these are the spectrum gram. So a uh, vertical axis are the frequency bins, discretized frequency bins from uh, 100 Hertz to 1000 Hertz. Horizontally, that's the time step over uh, 200 seconds. And the colors stand for the normalized um, uh, power in the detector. So this is re real, the real detector data around GW170 or A17. And the uh, dark, dark area is the noisy band we notch out in advance. So they look exactly the same, these two panels, but this one actually has a weak injection, which cannot see by eye. So we can apply the hidden Markov model tracking and get a best estimate of the path on the right in red. So this one actually has the probability below the threshold. So that's just a noise pass. And this one has the probability above the threshold. And you can see it tracks our injection very accurately. So although we use a model to inject the signal, but the search doesn't really rely on the model. Um, now you can see it's a very efficient and powerful search, even for such wide frequency band and rapidly in some loud transient noise. So overall, this method has already been used in many continuous wave search and long duration gravitational wave search, including the analysis in the latest observing run. Um, I wouldn't have time to talk about the details of the latest uh, real search, but you can check out the LIGO Virgo Kagura uh, publications for the latest analysis for continuous waves. So a uh, quick summary here. In this talk, I mainly introduced the continuous wave and long duration gravitational wave sources, why they are interesting, and the very useful hidden Markov model tracking technique, which help us to solve many difficulties in these searches. So this is only one out of many smart algorithms used to search for continuous waves. Although we don't have a detection yet, um, we start to probe very interesting parameter space like a very low intensity of the neutron star, um, a very tiny uh, strain amplitude of the signal, et cetera. So in the future, of course, the detector will be further improved. And meantime, we are also improving our uh, analysis method like uh, to in incorporate more advanced signal processing techniques and data analysis techniques. So we really hope to detect these very weak emissions in near future. And that will really bring us invaluable information about these fascinating um, astrophysical sources. So um, that's all I want to share. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you.